So continuing on with graphing polynomial functions, at this point we know how to find the n behavior and we know how to find the y-intercept. Our next step is to find the zeros of the polynomial function. Now this is something that you've actually done before, they've just switched vocabulary words on you. So let's just learn what a zero actually means and how that is displayed on our graph. So the definition of a zero, here they call it c, if c, meaning a number, is a zero of the function, then f of c, or f of that number, is equivalent to zero. Meaning, if we ever want to find the zero of a function, then we just set our function in general equivalent to zero. So let's see an actual example of this. So my first example of f of x is equal to negative x to the fourth plus 12x squared minus 27. If I want to find the zero of this function, then I just ignore the name of this function of f of x and I set my equation itself equal to zero. And I need to solve this equation using all of those methods that we learned back in chapter one. So your first thought process here should be what type of equation do I have? Is it a polynomial? And if so, what's the degree? And what are the steps depending upon that degree of the polynomial? If it was something else, then I would have to follow those steps instead. Since this whole section here is purely on finding the zeros of a polynomial, most of the time our steps are going to be factor, and that's exactly what we want to do with this equation. My first thing that I want to do is factor out a negative of this equation. That's going to make the rest of my factoring steps easier. Beyond that, I see I have three terms in this polynomial, so I will factor it using my trinomial method by setting up my two parentheses. x squared times x squared gives me x to the fourth. 9 times 3 gives me 27. And a negative 9 times a negative 3 gives me a positive 27. But if I add negative 9 and negative 3, that gives me a negative 12x squared. I can continue to factor one of these pieces because it's a difference of squares. I can factor this one here because both of my terms involved are squares. The other one I cannot factor, but it will still give me two separate answers. The other factor, I cannot factor it farther, but I'm still going to have to do some extra work with it, and I'll show you that in a minute. So continuing with my factor, I get negative x plus 3 times x minus 3 times x squared minus 3. Now I know I have it factored completely, and my next step to solving this equation is setting each factor equal to 0. The first one of setting a negative equal to zero doesn't make any sense, or a negative one equal to zero, so I throw that one away. Then I have x plus three equal to zero. Moving three to the opposite side, that gives me the solution of x equals negative three. I also have x minus three equal to zero. Moving my negative three to the opposite side gives me x equals positive three. And then my last factor is x squared minus 3 equal to 0. Again, I start by moving my 3 to the opposite side. It gives me x squared is equal to 3. To completely isolate my x, I need to get rid of the squared. And the opposite operation of that is to force in a square root. And whenever I do that, I must also force in a plus and a minus. So this one gives me the solution of x equals positive root 3, and x equals a negative root 3. Thus, I actually have four zeros of this function. Now, you can always double check the number of zeros by looking at the degree of the problem. This is a degree 4 problem, so I should have four zeros. And I see them here, positive 3, negative 3, positive root 3, and negative root 3. So let's see a 
second example of finding the zeros of an equation. Again, our whole process of this is ignoring the name of the function and setting our whole function equal to zero. Now this one is actually really easy, much easier than the last one, because it's already in factored format. So you don't even have to do any work with it, you just have to set each factor equal to zero. So the first one of one ninth equal to zero, doesn't make any sense, I throw it away. X minus one equals zero, gives me the solution of X equals one. X plus four equals zero, gives me the solution of X equals negative four. And X minus five equals zero, gives me the solution of X equals five. Now I've skipped a step here. I isolate these x's by doing opposite operations of moving those numbers to the other side. But I think that we've seen enough examples of this that you are fine in following me skipping that step. So I have three solutions. And if I were to multiply out this problem, I would have a degree three polynomial. X times X times X gives me X to the third. So that confirms that I should have three solutions. So let's see some notes that we should mentally make about finding the zeros of an equation. So things that we've already seen here, the number of zeros is the same as the degree. So if it's a degree five polynomial, then you should have five zeros. And the second one is notice that all of my solutions thus far have always been in the format of X equals a particular number where that number is the zero. And we saw that both in example one and in example two. So beyond finding zeros, there's actually another step that we could add to this process. So we could find the zeros and we could state the multiplicities of each zero. Meaning, how many times are each of those zeros a actual solution to that problem? In our last two examples, each zero is only a solution one time. So each of these is only one solution. And again, that is the same for both of the examples that I've given so far. So let's see when I might have a zero that is actually a solution more than one. And that's here in example three. So again, this is an easier version of finding the zeros because it's in factored format. So I ignore the name, I set my whole equation equal to zero, and I just set each factor equal to zero. So 4x cubed equal to zero, 2x minus nine to the fourth equal to zero, and four minus five x squared equal to zero. The difference between this example and in the last example is when I had factors, I only had one factor each. Now I see that I have a factor of 2x minus 9, but I have it four times. So what I could do is I could write that 2x minus 9 out four times, but that's just redundant. I don't need to do that. That's extra work. All I need to do is find the zero or the solution for the inside of my equation and state that I have that solution four times. So the power here is how many times that zero is a solution to the problem or what multiplicity is that zero going to be. So instead of setting 2x minus 9 to the fourth equal to zero, I'm just going to set 2x minus 9 equal to zero. If I add nine and divide by two on both sides, that gives me X equals nine halves. That gives me one solution to the problem, but I had that four times. So that means I have this solution as a multiplicity of four. So now I know how to find the zeros and the multiplicity of each of them. So with my last solution here, four minus five X, if I set that whole factor equal to zero, if I move five X to the opposite side and then divide by five, that gives me X is equal to four fifths. But notice I had that twice. So this guy here is a multiplicity of two. 
back to my first factor, don't forget about it. I just left it for a moment so I can show you the examples with the other two. Here, if I divide by 4 on both sides of this equation, that gives me x cubed equals 0, which means that x in itself has to be 0. But my power of 3 means that I actually have 0 as a solution 3 different times. So 0 is a 0 multiplicity 3. Kind of sounds weird when you say it like that, but these are all of the zeros of my function. Because in time, I'm going to stop this video here, but in the next video, I'm going to show you how the zeros fit in with graphing polynomial functions because that is our ultimate goal.